officially opened with great fanfare on Friday and still they're waiting at the Nightingale Hospital in the XL Centre for any of the beds to be used. Channel 4 News understands that the first eight intensive care patients will be transferred tomorrow, but we also understand that many of the beds may never be filled. New modelling shows they may only ever need 300 at a time. Intensive care specialists have learned a hard lesson from Italy that the numbers who benefit from ICU and ventilation are lower than first thought. What we've learned from our colleagues in Europe and some, from some early data in this country is that sometimes with this particular condition, people with extensive underlying illness and people who are older tend to do less well. And that's meant that our decision making has, if you like, the goalposts have moved slightly. And it's not always the right thing to do to put someone on a ventilator with COVID-19. And today at the Downing Street press conference, they also said social distancing may be working. In the number of cases in our hospitals is not as bad as it would have been if we had not made these efforts. So it is working. But the big question is, is, it, is the virus spread slowing down enough to make hospital admissions stabilise and then even fall? And is there any suggestion that maybe you won't need uh, as many beds as the, at the XL centre at the Nightingale as you had expected? If we end up in a situation where we have more ICU beds at all times during this epidemic than we absolutely need to deal both with COVID and other areas, that will be a success. That is something which is critical for our overall aid. It is part of the steep and distressing learning curve that has become this pandemic. So many questions, still too few answers. But here is an attempt. Bart's Hospital in London is testing healthcare workers so research can look at why does one person, for instance the Prime Minister, end up in hospital while another, for instance the Health Secretary, is able to return to work seven days later. The potential use of this research is to design personalised risk scores for people based on their prior viral exposures or genetics, to detect the earliest changes of disease to, to design uh, pre and post exposure prophylaxis, to look at the immediate changes after infection with the prior uh, blood samples so that we can help uh, develop the antibody assays that are appropriately sensitive and specific, to check for the waning of immunity after an infection to ensure whether or not immunity is likely to be sustained over time, to create uh, understandings of hospital chains of transmission as to whether or not healthcare workers are actually getting it in certain areas of the hospital. They want to recruit a thousand healthcare workers and because this was set up with incredible speed, it took them eight days, they've been fundraising to pay for the research. The traditional funding routes take too long. There is a feeling now of pressure building up. The warnings that peak of admissions could come around Easter time and staff absences are still high. Two Royal Colleges estimating as many as 25% either self-isolating or infected. We'll go into um, how you're going to wrap the deceased um, with as much dignity and respect um, to the families um, and to the deceased as possible. These are specialist teams being trained to respond to suspected COVID-19 deaths in the community across London. Police officers, fire and health services staff, they will confirm the person's identity, that they are dead and that there are no suspicious circumstances. This is sad but necessary planning, as it's now estimated that the number of people dying in the community is 30% of all COVID deaths. Today, London's Mayor Sadiq Khan said 10 public transport workers have died in the capital after testing positive. And on a daily basis now are reports of patients being transferred between hospitals because of a lack of capacity, of morgues filling up, and of equipment and drug shortages the NHS right at the heart of this crisis. And Victoria joins us now, as she does every night. Good to see you, Victoria. Uh, yes, Matt. Um, at the beginning of my piece there, I was talking about whether the Nightingale will ever be used to the capacity, we were told, 4,000 beds. Uh, now, it seems funny to build these infrastructures right across the UK and then not use them, but that's really what they want to do. Sadly, some of the evidence out of Italy is that there is no point putting some of the very elderly, frail, 
people with lots of comorbidities uh, onto ventilation, and so they're making harder decisions. But in fact, this is what intensive care doctors and specialists mm. have to do every day anyway, and we will hear more about that at the uh, uh, further down our program. Now, there were some quite alarming reports over the weekend of hospitals running out of oxygen. Is that actually true? Yes, uh, Watford General actually had a problem. It comes down to good planning. Now, what I've been told by a chief executive of one hospital is that you, you have to look at the size of your pipes, the capacity of your oxygen tanks, and how many machines are in use. And you should be able to see in advance when it's going to become a, a problem. And that's why we've been seeing patients being moved around from one hospital to another to as they become aware that the oxygen is going to be a, an issue at that hospital. Mm. It's not about oxygen supply, it's about the hospital's ability to get the supply through its system. Oxygen plumbing. Victoria Oxygen plumbing. Thanks very much indeed. Well, joining me now is Dr. Anthony Costello, who is Professor of Global Health at University College London and the former director of the World Health Organization. Thanks for coming on the programme again, uh, Anthony. Let's just start with one thing to clear up. You know, we heard the Prime Minister's symptoms described there as, you know, as mild, and then he seemed to be getting better, then he seemed to be getting worse. This is sort of the rhythm of the disease, isn't it? Yes, I mean, he's got a very good team of physicians. I'm sure they're assessing him. They've obviously wanted to do some tests. But if he's feeling reasonably well, there's no reason why he shouldn't continue working. And mm. uh, I'm sure they'll come to the right decision. But also in the sense that he, he might feel he's getting better one day and then the next day he's going to get worse again. I've heard that described with quite a lot of patients. Yeah, that may be the case. OK, let's move on to the wider picture then. I mean, he is the prime minister is in his mid 50s. That's my age as well. Um, there seem to be an awful lot of patients in ICU in their mid 50s or younger. Have we basically sent out the wrong message from the very beginning of this disease by saying that it only really affects seriously, you know, people above the age of 65 or so? Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, obviously, that is an older age group who are more at risk. But, um, you know, if we want to really suppress this disease, and I, I'm still unclear from the press conference today, there's been good progress with surge capacity, the, the social distancing is working. But I'm really not clear whether this is a delay policy to let the epidemic run smoothly or, and, and build herd immunity, or whether we are really trying to suppress the disease so that younger people that you're talking about will not get it and that for that we've got to suppress the chain of transmission and to do that we've got to find the the virus and and i spoke to a, a world expert on epidemic control the other day and uh, you know i said will social distancing work and and they said no not alone this is guerrilla warfare you've got a bundle of measures that you've got to do you've got to get out into communities talk to people mm. who've got symptoms, reassure them, find their contacts, sort their problems out and monitor their symptoms and go back and do that repeatedly. And you've got to do it at speed. We've been a bit slower. That's why our death rates are much higher than the Asian states. But we've got a public health system to do that. In fact, it was the influenza surveillance people that picked up the first cases of um, a coronavirus here. And I think that we need to mobilize, now that we've got this much bigger problem of getting out to communities with our primary healthcare teams, I think we've got environmental health officers trained in contact tracing. We've got 750,000 volunteers, many of them with clinical and nursing skills. Right. So I think we could tap into that, even if we've been a bit late to the party. And then we can suppress it. And I think that's an important difference from a delay policy. But just to be clear, the government would say that it ditched the herd immunity policy some time ago. It's now all about suppression. You don't think that they've got there because they're not doing all the things they need to do in order to suppress the infections? Well, I think they can boost it. I mean, I, I hope it's not clear to me because they stopped uh, formal contact tracing on March the 12th. And I haven't heard them say that they are reinstating that. Personally, I think that should happen over the next month because really what we want to focus on are the 3% of people mm. who've got the infection or are contacts rather than closing the entire economy down uh, and, and affecting, you know, 80% of us. I... And the evidence is mounting that this approach to uh, case detection, 
testing, isolation mm. and close follow up in the community is a much more effective and efficient way. And it will get the, uh, the, the epidemic down much quicker. Right. Just in 10 seconds, what you're saying is that if we have a lockdown and we test, but we don't do the tracing, there's no point to the lockdown because we're not going to solve the wider issue. Well, you're not going to find all the cases, and, and we need a mechanism to mm. monitor that. You see in Korea and China, Singapore, that's what they're doing. They are well aware that this okay. may come back up. But because they've got their death rates right down, much lower than us, they've now got a mechanism to go and look for it. And okay. I think that's really important, and we should be uh, holding the government to account on that. Okay. Professor Anthony Costello, thank you very much indeed.